Any parent's worst nightmare is to watch as their child succumbs to an illness that they are powerless over. And the woman we're going to talk to next watched as her beautiful and bubbly 14-year-old daughter, Lynn, deteriorated in front of her eyes for 17 years with a condition called ME. Medical tests showed up nothing, yet her daughter was paralyzed and in constant agony. And in the end, after 17 years, her daughter, Lynn, wanted her life to end and her treatment to stop. Her mother, a trained nurse, helped her to administer a fatal dose of morphine in an act of love and mercy and was subsequently accused of attempted murder. Uh, she joins me now to tell that story. Kay Gilderdale, good morning. Good morning, Pat. Now, tell us a little bit about Lynn before she became sick. I mean, she was a typical energetic schoolgirl. She was indeed. She was full of life and uh, the joys of life very, very active and sporty and um, enjoyed sailing and swimming and cycling and dance and ballet and music and meeting with her friends in the local youth club. And she liked to participate in everything. Mm. She, was and she, she wasn't driven by you guys. I mean, she took a piano just for the pleasure of playing it, not to pass exams. She did, yes. She didn't take the exam. She just loved music and she wanted to play. And... Um, there was never any pressure on her. We weren't the sort of parents who put an awful lot of pressure on our children. Um, you know, they, if they were self-motivated, we guided them, you know, yeah. as you need to with children. But there wasn't an awful lot of pressure. They, they both, Lynn and my son Steve, they, they were self-motivated in a lot of things. Tell us what happened that day in November 1991 when her school called to say that she was sick. I mean, that happens from time to time to parents that they get a call from the school. So I presume you weren't too alarmed. I wasn't worried at all. I just thought, you know, it was just something insignificant, like, you know, children pick up bugs or um, just feel unwell or something. So I went along without any worries, picked her up and um, brought her home. And she thought she was better the next day. Um, and she went off to school again, but I got a call again. And in fact, she was never able to go to school. After that, she got one infection after another and quite rapidly became very ill. So she was being treated with antibiotics for infections and so on. And then how, how did the condition manifest itself as something more sinister? Well, she had inf infections one after another for about three months. And um, by... Um, February, which was three months from when she had a vaccination, she um, was beginning to show signs of um, poor memory and noise and light sensitivity and fainting and not having any energy and also was worrying because if you have infections, you don't expect to get one after the other like mm -hmm. that. And um, you begin to think, well, what's going on here? So, so three months into the illness, we were very worried. Because she'd had bronchitis, then that was followed by tonsillitis and then glandular fever, another chest infection. Yes. It just was one damn thing after another. It was, yeah. And then she said, crying, what is wrong with me? Yes. I mean, she was really fed up with having to be at home and she missed her friends and she wanted to do all the normal sort of things because it was a complete change around from how she was before. And um, she was fed up with it, and she's, she's saying, what's happening? And, of course, I didn't have, we didn't have the answers. We were going to our doctor saying, you know, can you do this test, that test? What can you do to find mm -hmm. out what's going on? And any tests that were done just came back negative. They tested her for leukemia? Negative. Um, they tested her for, I don't know exactly all the things they tested her for now, but I know our GP was marvellous and she sent off various tests and it was always a negative result. At that point, I don't think they were testing her for leukaemia. Um, later on, I expect they, they went into those. But um, in February, she actually collapsed and um, was, she was like fitting and um, difficulty breathing and we called an ambulance and she was taken to hospital and that resulted in a diagnosis of ME. Now ME people uh, would be familiar with it because uh, there was a time when we frequently did items on the program and people saying well you know the yuppie flu, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, is it real, is it imal imagined but ME stands for myalgic encephalomyelitis yes. uh, which is what exactly? It's um, 
it, the myalgic bit is where it affects the muscles and the encephalitis is where it affects the nervous system. And in Lynn's case, I mean, it became very clear after a number of years that, that it was a neurological problem. And um, we had tests done for other things which actually showed that it was, there was a problem with her brain sending out messages. And after she died, um, we had, um, her, her body went for ME research. And we found that um, in her spinal cord, she had inflammation of the nerve roots and also a lot of dead cells that would have caused a lot of problems with uh, pain throughout her body and um, and interfering with with messages so there was something that only the post-mortem could reveal that was the inflammation that was there and all the the the, the explanation if you like for the the pain and misery that she'd had to go through yes and it's it's very unfortunate that there isn't something a test that can be done while somebody is alive because, of course, um, ME is very controversial and uh, there are still a lot of doctors who don't accept it as a physical illness. And as a result, Lynn suffered. Um, on top of having a, a, a terrible illness, she, she suffered um, from disbelief and, and being forced to do things mm. that she wasn't able to do. Um, and that's it's something that is very important to understand that in the early acute stages it's important not to force yourself to do things because it can change the course of the illness yeah. if you do the right things in the beginning you know a lot of people recover from ME and um, you do the wrong things and it can make you um, a lot worse and end up as severely disabled and ill as Lynn, Lynn was there was a program of graded exercise uh, prescribed for her and you know she didn't feel like doing it and had to force herself to do it yes and that it turns out is probably the wrong way to go yes i mean at the, we're talking about 17 years ago and um the consultant who diagnosed her put her on a course of graded exercise and of course we um made sure that lynn followed um the doctor's instructions and when she tried to do it for example she had to do a certain amount of social activity a certain amount of schoolwork a certain amount of physical exercise and if we walked her down the road just a short distance by the time she came back we were having to prop her up and she was dragging her legs and she would come indoors and, and basically collapse. So in that initial stage, she should really have been resting. And then at a later stage, when she was over that acute phase, um, then, you know, work on the, the, the activity and the, mm -hmm. the rehabilitation. But of course, we didn't know at the time and we, we, we insisted that she did what, what she was told to do. The progression of her illness was at a frightening speed, really. I mean, yes. difficulty in eating or swallowing, even speaking. Yes. Within six months, um, it was very rapid and it was very frightening. And within six months, she, from being that healthy, lively teenager, she was totally bedridden. She couldn't move anything. She couldn't lift her head off the pillow. She couldn't swallow. She couldn't speak. She was in terrible pain, having awful muscle spasms, sickness and memory loss and uh, noise and light sensitivity, just totally different to, to the child that we had, you know, for the 14 years before. This took a terrible toll on your own marriage. Well, yes. I mean, my ex-husband was very supportive and we had, you know, we'd been married for 20, 26 years, um, but it it changed the dynamics of the family altogether. It wasn't just the marriage, you know, because Lynn needed total care. She needed everything done for her, and it didn't leave an awful lot of time for for everything else. And that was the way it had to be, because it was it was almost a constant job um, looking after Lynn. And unfortunately, yes, the marriage. Did um, did break down, but you know it it wasn't it wasn't just because of the ME. There were there were other factors. Mm -hmm. You know maybe the, you know some people might have might have been able to work it out, but um, sadly 
we weren't able to, but the stress that the illness put on on the whole family was was huge. Lynn came home from school that day when she was 14, and her illness became progressively worse over the next 17 years. I mean, what state was she at towards the end of her life in terms of what she was capable of doing? Um, she was still totally bedridden and paralysed and couldn't swallow. She hadn't had ordinary food. She was tube fed for, she hadn't had ordinary food for 16 and a half years. She couldn't speak still. And she was still in terrible pain despite very large doses of morphine. Um, continual infections in and out of hospital, needing a lot of care and, and it was a real struggle on a daily basis because she had a lot of things wrong in her body. But um, it, Lynn had enormous courage and hope that she was going to recover and she held on to that for 14 years. Um, and it was a change came about after she um, one of her many admissions to hospital where she had crisis treatment. She had a, a punctured lung and she was on a life support machine. And it seemed when she came home from that after three months that um, she felt that her body was too broken. Too many things had gone wrong and she began to lose hope after, you know, really holding on to that for such a long time. So she began to lose hope and she began to talk about it and the fact that she couldn't go on living this life that was so terrible and not the life, even if she had any quality where she could sit in a wheelchair and be wheeled out, anything. But she couldn't see that there was any way she was going to recover because it, she had problems with her heart, uh, with her kidneys, um, the, the mother gland had shrunk and then it wasn't sending out messages to to any glands in the body to make hormones so she'd been through the menopause she had adrenal failure she had thyroid problems um, and she had severe osteoporosis she had lost 50 percent of her bone loss so she she had sustained fractures by being lifted you know from a, the bed to a stretcher and things like that um, her body you know every every system her immune system was gone um, she had, she had um, stomach problems, you name it, uh, she had it. Uh, each day was, was filled with pain and, and sickness. How did she communicate to you that she wanted to end her life? Um, as I said, she couldn't speak, but um, she had, as soon as she was able to move her hands, she had devised a sign language of her own, and we learned her language. We, we, any, any sign she made with her hands, her nurses and myself and her dad and brother learnt it. So that was the way we communicated. And over the years, we all got quite good at it. And um, then eventually Lynn's memory did improve. And she began, because she couldn't read or write at her worst, but um, she could never write again. But she could, began to be able to read and she could, she could um, type on a little handheld computer. So um, she, she could communicate things to me by typing them out, but also we could, we could converse quite easily with her sign language mm -hmm. because we had you know, used it for so long. And um, she, on a daily, eventually on a daily basis, she, she was telling me that she couldn't go on and, and needed, needed to end um, the suffering and to find, to find some peace. Now, she had a, a Hickman line going into her, a permanent catheter, yes. uh, through which the morphine could be administered. Yes. And it was uh, December 2008 when she decided to take action. What yes. Did, what did she do? Um, 